Ghana's 2020 presidential election will once again have an independent presidential candidate on the ballot. If past experience is anything to go by, this is likely to be a case of an also run, a candidate that hardly registers on the results radar. It's not unreasonable to expect the day to belong to one of the candidates of the two leading political parties. But given the frustration with the performance of our political class over the years, is there the possibility of an independent candidate performing a lot better than expected? My guess is despite the near impossibility of this feat, he will run for president as an independent candidate. Does he really believe he has a good chance at the polls? When we come back, I will introduce you to him. Mara Kofigan, welcome to Time with David. Thank you, David. The first time I saw you, somebody sent me a little clip of you saying it said gun for president. And there was a very interesting piece. You want to run as an independent candidate in Ghana's 2020 presidential elections. That's correct. Why? Why? Well, I'll tell you a little story, David. Yeah. I lived with my grandfather in Keta. Um, and he told me stories about uh, the Volta Transport Company and how Keta used to be very uh, uh, economically a strong piece within more the vibrant. Union. More vibrant. More mm -hmm. vibrant. Uh, you know, ships coming to dock. Uh, it was a trading hub for Togo yeah. on the one side uh, and Nigeria and then for Cape Coast and the rest on the other side. Um, and he told me interesting stories about how the economy boomed. In fact, he said Keta was the fourth largest uh, uh, town within Ghana at the time. That was my grandfather's era. Um, and then my father told me stories about him at KNUST, Common uh, Kruma University of Science and Technology, um, and how he had a whole room to himself. Mm -hmm. uh, they had breakfast before they went to school, had a snack at 10 a.m., another snack at 10 p.m. The good old uh, days. The good old days. <laughs> um, and for me, that, that sounded like a country I wanted to be in. Um, in my dispensation, in my generation, I have walked to a young man and asked him, what is his Ghanaian dream? And his response to me, David, was that, I just want a Ghana where I do not have to travel outside the country to make the best of myself. When I hear stories like that, and when I see my country where every week there is a scandal, or when I see GSS results that are just uh, a little bit above 50% every year consistently, I worry. And that worry means that I don't have a choice, that we have to do this. Uh, and that's why I'm doing this. And that's why you're doing this. Yes. And you think to make a change, you have to be the president. It and has to be that because at that level, you can make a wider impact right. than doing it piecemeal. People say to me, you could have done this in, in your own little corner, but yeah. we are way behind, David, and doing things like this in one's little corner is, is not the way to go. It works I, better when you have... I think we need to catch up, and we need to catch up pretty fast. Yeah. We and used to be pay setters. Correct. So what would you do different as a president? A lot. Um, it depends on which sector you're looking yeah, at. Yeah. Um, I mean, overall, just, just, just on the basis of what you've just said, that we need to catch up and so on. I mean, there are people in the position now, people there before, and we are where we are. Right. What would you do different, Mr. Gann? i tell you what, David. Um, let me share my vision with you, very yeah. short yeah. vision. Yeah. My vision is largely to say... Let's build a Ghana in which leaders, for example, uh, ascribe to the value of putting Ghana first. That's one. I want us to build an educational system that ensures that we are grounded in the science and the competencies to solve our own problems. Mm. I want us to be able to have a public sector that is disciplined, but that also understands the future enough to, to position our country in it. Mm. I want us to have citizens and businesses that are equipped enough and properly to be able to stay relevant both in Ghana and, and elsewhere. But I also want a Ghana in which everybody lives in good health and that we can share prosperity together. Let me, let me test that. Let me just... Every single thing you've just said, I'm sure the current president, the president before, other candidates would say. 
I mean, why must we believe that you uh, can do it and they can't if they haven't? I can answer for them. Right. That's one. Okay. What I do know is that I want to do things a bit differently from the world. I'll give you an example. Let's take health. Mm. Each of the presidents before, uh, from uh, Kufour, uh, Jia Mills, uh, Mahama, and even currently, take, mm. uh, take health, for mm. example. Their focus is on building hospitals. Mm. That's not health. Because I'll tell you what, in the last at least 16 years, um, and if we counter this last two years, that makes it about 18, we spent an average of 18, sorry, 2 billion every year, dollars, on health. Our life expectancy hasn't changed. So it's really not about building buildings. We, we need to get outputs and, and outcomes out of what we're doing. And so my focus is on doing the things that reflect in people's lives. We can't continue saying, you know, GDP is increasing and Ghana is the fastest growing economy when the pockets of the people does not reflect that. Have you done any of this before? You haven't. You haven't done any of this before. None of and, the presidents before And now you're telling me, us that you can do this. None of the presidents before me have been presidents before. But couldn't that not be part of the problem? No, not being president before. When I said, have you done this before? I didn't mean have you been president before. Right. I mean, have you dealt with these issues before? I have been in international development uh, at least for the last decade. So whether, not necessarily in Ghana, but in other different, different economies. Yeah. So I'm trying I to have, understand how your, your experiences have prepared you. That's right. my real aim. Yeah. So it, I, I just talked about health. Mm. Um, I have worked in South Sudan. Uh, I don't like sharing that example a lot because of the, uh, the, the things around the war and all that around that. But we went into South Sudan when I worked for uh, the UK agency and built a health sector from scratch up. So these things are things that I bring from practice into, into the seat I want to mm. occupy. But then beyond that is that I am a professional. I am hoping and will bring professionals who can get the job done, not people who have made the most political noise during a campaign. You're, a, you're an accountant. I am an accountant, professionally. I've been an accountant, an auditor, consultant uh, in that area. Does that, do you, does that also prepare you? I would imagine. It has, in a large way. Because, you see, being an accountant, you yeah. get groomed in a certain way. Right. Accountability is one thing. Uh, integrity is another. So we can talk about corruption. We can talk about Let, Let's corruption. talk about corruption. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about corruption. In my view, mm. you know, I want a president that can fight corruption. I'm, conv I'm not even interested in presidents talking about health, education, so on. Okay. Because you can sort of, if you blow the money, you blow the money, it doesn't work. Right. What would you do? to fight corruption. I'll tell you what, David. To fight corruption, you need to understand how corruption works. Um, and so mostly when people talk about corruption, they are literally talking about procurement fraud. But there's several layers and types of corruption, and you need to understand each of them. We've got things around capital slimming. We've got things around uh, 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 income ghosting. We've got uh, corruption around uh, mispricing or, 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 or the likes. Yeah. Uh, by international organizations that are represented in Ghana. Right. So if you understand these types of corruption, which I do because that's what I have dealt with most of my life, mm. then you understand how to deal with them. I tell you what, we've got about seven to eight ways we want to uh, deal with corruption. And each of them is going to ensure that all these various areas I've listed out actually are captured in the solution process. Tell me one. Let's focus on one. One of the ways that, the principal ways that you would deal with corruption. The principal way I would, mm. that's not even, okay. One of the things I want to say is that mm. I want to ensure zero tolerance for corruption Correct. at the presidency. Right. You see, for me, that means that's a lot. So you'd be starting from the top. It has to start from the top. Yeah. And the reason why that is the case is that until you do that, you cannot have the moral right to have that descended into the lower ranks of, of the executive mm. authority or of ministries or of any other Very interesting. Uh, ranking. Very interesting. So it has to start from the top. And I put myself accountable to that. That's very interesting. So for you to succeed in fighting corruption, the highest levels of government must set the example first. Absolutely. Uh, because otherwise, everybody down there Absolutely. says that, well, they are jumping so I can also choose. Absolutely. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. 
Give me a second way you'd fight corruption. A second way I want to fight corruption is to ensure that, I'll tell you an interesting thing, affordable housing. And we have to make housing very affordable. Not a hundred thousand. What's the relationship between that and fighting okay, corruption? Okay, I'll tell you what. The value system in Ghana is such that everybody wants to own a property at the end of their working life. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. What it does mean, however, is that if somebody, for example, is working in the public sector and he hits the age of, say, 55 and realizes that, oops, my salary has not been enough mm. to put up a house and I only have five years to go on retirement, a panic button goes up. The incentive for corruption The incentive in. for corruption goes up. And the fact that our systems are not strong enough, combined together with you know, that incentive and an opportunity, means that people are going to want to do everything possible to grab something quickly, to get a piece of land, grab something quickly, to put up a, a one or two bedroom house or, or, or of the sort. If we have a system where we can say, okay, let's use the SNEET proceeds and, and structure them in such a way that they can actually be used for uh, affordable housing processes. Mm -hmm. Then we are giving people an incentive to do the right thing whilst they are in employment and to start early in that process. So you have a young person who gets into employment and from day one he is starting to get on the mortgage to get a building. He does not have to wait till he's about 50 or so years and start panicking and start stealing money. I take it that it, that applies to other things. Housing was just an example. Housing was just an example. So the principal point you're making is that we must have an environment that enables people to what? To, to, to satisfy to their basic needs. To create value for themselves. And, and yeah. yes, satisfy their basic needs. So, so um, that's your... So, but, but, but corruption is often from greed. I mean, the suggestion that maybe people who don't have are suddenly going to start looking for doesn't deal with the problem. I mean, there are a lot of people with substantial resources. They are the ones who engage in real corruption. And by the way, when I say corruption, I mean government corruption. I'm not interested in that talk about sector, some three yeah, some petty people. No, 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 no. Right. The big boys. Right. I'll tell you one other thing that we're, we're looking to do. Yeah. I think one of the biggest problems we've had in this country where corruption is concerned is enforcement. Often when I say this, I like to link it with the issue around political parties and how we've run them in this country. When you have two people from the same party in government, mm. um, and he's been put there simply because he funded you the most during your political campaign, and he steals money, mm. it's going to be hard for you to punish him. And the reason why that is the case is that on the one hand, you are going to feel that it's going to be bad on the party to, you know, take your own brother or your own uh, colleague off the grid. <laughs> um, and so more likely than not, you are more tempted to just stay quiet and deal with it or, as they say in Ghana, clear the person off. That's not the way to deal with corruption. And as long as that link becomes a part of running a system, and I often say this, that we make the mistake of moving the way we have run politics and make it the way we, we organize government. The two are separate things. One is a professional institution. One is an art. How are you going to fund your campaign? You're talking about parties and so on. So who funds you? How are you going to be president? The you, ordinary you... people will fund this campaign. How? By they, crowdsourcing. They, by crowdsourcing. You Why see, one of the things... Crowdsourcing, that, just before you go on, crowdsourcing meaning that you will get people to ordinary believe... Ghanians. Ordinary Ghanaians. to believe in your idea and give you a CD. Everybody give you a CD. Am I correct? They've already started doing that. Okay. And, 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 and the reason is what? Why must they give see, their the CD reason, the reason is simple. Mm. Currently, as it is, we've got big funders of political parties, which are not, you know, accountability-wise, they're not put out there, so nobody knows who they are. Clear. What we do know, however, is that most of the people who fund these political parties do so with attachments, which means if I give you a million, I expect that when you win power, I want to take on the ministry of X, Y, Z. 
not because he's actually capable of running that ministry, but mm. because out of lack of trust, he feels that he needs to be in that ministry himself mm. in order to be able to safeguard the recoupment of his monies. That's what we want to move away from. So my principle is this. If indeed the people who come into power bear allegiance to the people who fund them, I want to bear allegiance to the majority of Ghanaians. Let me take you back to where I began in terms of how we do this. Okay. In this country, mm. there are two dominant political parties. There have been independent candidates along the way. They don't even register. I mean, a fraction of the vote. The real thing happens between the candidates of the two parties. Correct. The Ghanaians seem completely you know, in there, which is not too strange. I'm sure you know that. In the United States, the dominant parties in mm. Europe everywhere. Doesn't that tell you that an independent candidate is really going nowhere? What it tells me is that there is a possibility. Rather. And yes. Interesting. See, because the NDC and the NPP are the only brands that have been sold properly to Ghanaians all this while. What I'm trying to do is to let Ghanaians know that, forget about even branding. Where we are at now, we do not have a choice. We don't have a choice because you cannot do more of the same thing and expect different results. If in the last 27 plus years, we as Ghanaians feel that what we have has not worked for us. We cannot go down the same line. And so what I'm offering to Ghanaians is an opportunity. And, and mind you, the demographics have changed. Um, the feelings of Ghanaians towards you know, how the state is run has changed mm. uh, from the last two elections. So um, all that is going to come into play in 2020. And so it is not what it used to be. Um, it's moving and it is changing. And that's what... To the I, point where I they will believe, dump their traditional parties, the NDC and NPP, to vote for an independent well, here's the thing. candidate whom they hardly know. Here's would, the thing, David. Yeah. The Ghanaian people have a choice to make. It is their responsibility to decide. And this is not about NDC or NPP. Mm. They have a responsibility to ask themselves... Is my pocket working okay? Is my life working okay? Are the futures of my children looking great? I just told you the story of my grandfather mm, and my father. father. If it is not looking the way, when we're deteriorating, if it is not looking the way it is supposed to be looking and we're rather going down the drain, then we all need to wake up and make a choice. That choice has to happen in 2020. And the reason why I say that, David, mm -hmm. is that we do not have another 27 years. I don't. But Others do not. Kofi, it's been going on. The decline in various areas that you described. I mean, imagine, you said your grandfather, your father. That just tells me how long it's been going. Yeah. And the people continue to opt for the current political arrangement. What is it that you think is so different now that will make them dump what they know for something new? They, okay, here's the thing for me. Perceptions are changing. Um, I don't know if you notice, but if you do, you realize that Ghanaians are beginning to speak out a lot more now. Right. They are beginning to be a bit more conscious. Uh, the diaspora is beginning to have a lot more influence internally. Uh, we have a lot more younger people who do not actually care so much about the traditions of their fathers, right. but are in a state where in mentally they want to be responsible for their own choices. These are factors nobody can ignore. And those are factors I'm appealing to. As a matter of fact, I say to even the very elderly uh, people like my people in my father's age group uh, and those older than him. And I say to them, look, you have tasted the good times. Mm. If you do not feel that those good times are what we have now, you actually do have a responsibility to leave something different behind for your kids. It's the best you can do. Mm. Because you've made choices that have not argued well for the, the children you have, the great-grandchildren or the grandchildren you have now. 
So it is everybody's responsibility to ensure that we do make this change happen. We cannot pretend and say we'll leave the change to happen automatically between the NDC and the NPP. We have to be involved ourselves as people. You indicated that earlier on that you referred to a team. I, 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 I can understand that. What kind of team would you surround yourself with? You know, in Ghana, there's a big assumption that, I mean, if you're an independent candidate, you, know, they, 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 you have nobody. I mean, you have, <laughs> there's nobody behind you. Who are you going to work with? How are you going to achieve your aims and ambitions? Right. right. Let's talk a bit about that. Sure. How would you go about putting in place a team to enable you to do the things that you so dream about? First of all, I want to, and this is a principle of mine, uh, and pretty much because of how I've been brought up professionally, I want to have people around me who question me, who raise issues, but equally people around me who are very creative in their thinking processes. Right. Because we have to start doing things differently, and wildly differently in some cases. The question about how am I going to bring around people is, this, I have worked with professionals all my life. Um, and the beauty of running as an independent candidate is that I actually have a leeway mm. to bring in the best of Ghanaians, irrespective of their stature, whether politically mm. or otherwise. Mm. And so it's all about meritocracy for me. We have um, a, 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 a public institution that is responsible for recruiting the best minds and the best brains of Ghanaians uh, 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 in this country. We've sidelined that largely because... Does it do anything? It's largely because politicians who are required to fund these institutions and to give them the autonomy they need to actually bring the best brains have literally remained unfunded and, and controlled. And the idea is so that they can bring their own political stooges But into that is precisely the point I'm making And that is you. precisely what I want to change. I want to give these institutions... Yeah the leeway to say, you know what, find me the best Ghanaians. I don't care where they are in the world. Find me the best Ghanaian who can lead this institution, for example. But and party, leave them to do their job. But you have a party system where they're all, it's almost a patronage system, okay? There are all these party members, delegates. But that's the difference. That, that, that's the difference, David. Yeah, yeah. I am not coming in with a party. So I don't so have... So you would deprive all these people. I, it doesn't, they don't want a no. guy like you. Well, they don't have to need a guy like me. Right. So how are they going to do their party deals and get back? But this is not about party. This is about Ghana. That's the big difference. For me, that is the big difference. If I can put you in... But the Ghanaians you're dealing with, they have become used to this. They really... No, the Ghanaians who have become used to this are the Ghanaians who have benefited from this. Right. It's about time we clean up the system, David. We do need to clean up the system. And until we get that done, we can forget about development. You know, and it has to start from here. And cleaning up the system means what? Cleaning up the system can mean a lot of things. Uh, it doesn't necessarily but mean... But in the context that you just used it. What well, mean? here's what I say. Right. I want my ministers, for example, to have a social contract with me. You deliver A, B, and C within X, Y, Z time. If not, would you sack them? If not, well, if you're not delivering, then you need to go. You would sack it, It's as simple as that. Right. You see, I, 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 I take They don't very, sack people around here very often. People. No, not very often, mm. which is why it starts with choosing the best you right. can get. Right. People who have done it and people who you know can deliver. Right. That's why it has to have a thorough process, you know, in terms of recruiting the people. When they, and, and this, is the, this, is the, this is the thing that the private sector has that we have to learn from. We do need to import some of the commercial thinking into the way we run public institutions. Mm -hmm. In the private sector, you get brought on because you have put yourself forward as the best to get a job done. You don't get it done, you show the exit. It's not politics. That's not the way it happens in politics, but that's the way it should start to happen. We cannot say that as a public institution, we want to create the structures for private sector to thrive, but have lower standards than the private sector has. Then, then we're going against each other's flow. And that, that cannot be. And we've had that for too long, uh, to the point that the public sector right now is choked 
with a few people who actually are technically sound, mm -hmm. who are fully dedicated and want to serve the people, and a lot of what I call fat, which is largely people who have been brought in from their parties and dumped in their... Jobs for the boys. Jobs for the boys. And unfortunately, job for the boys translates into bad policies for the people. So you won't have any jobs for the boys? I don't have boys. You won't have any boys? No. Who, what do you have? Do you have men or what do you have? <laughs> I don't want to use that word now <laughs> because it's being know. used. Be it's safe, be safe. Well, well, I want to save myself that trouble. <laughs> but, but the point is that I have people, Ghanaians, who can get the job done. That's live, the live in Ghana, live abroad, everywhere. I mean, Anywhere. Mix. As long as they are Ghanaians, as long as the constitution allows them to be, to be brought on board and get a job done. Mm. And, and that, that's the thing for me. We have to see past this whole, um, you know, we, we need to have substance over form in everything we do. Mm. Um, and so for me, that's crucial. The right people have to get into the right spaces. What are some of the first things that you would do if you became the president? What are some of the very first steps you would take to send the signal that, I mean, this is a different ball game. One of the things I want to do, first of all, when I come um, uh, by the grace of God into power, is to have what we call a, a, a systems audit or an efficiency audit. I want every, and this is not the audit of, you know, to catch a thief or do anything mm -hmm. like that. I want to have... This most, is the accountant in you, sorry. Well, yeah. we, uh, pretty much. Yes, pretty yes. much yeah, the accountant. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. <laughs> but Go it's a good thing. Mm. Um, I want to have an efficiency audit done. I want to take the core ministries where we know that efficiency is lacking mm. um, and have an efficiency audit done. We want to see what is running the operations in those ministries mm. that are not delivering value. We want to look at where the duplications are. We want to look at the things that generally are making it impossible for us to put one CD in there uh, and get one CD of value out. We want to check that out. We want to clean that system and make it as lean and as efficient as possible. How long will that take to do? It shouldn't take anything um, uh, beyond six months to get done. If we don't clean up that system, what it means is that for every one city we put into the society, we're still going to be getting less out. And until we correct that, we can't move forward. That's one of the first things I want to do. The other kind of few things I want to do very quickly when we get into power is to do... Uh, there are so many uh, government assets lying around. Some we don't even know. Uh, some we know but are being handled by individuals mm -hmm. and all that. And it's, and it's government money, it's public money going down the drain. We want to correct that. I want, I want to see... How do you want to correct that? Well, it's easy. What do you want, complete the projects? Or tell Not me. necessarily complete the projects. We want to look at all the projects that are out there, right. some that have been abandoned, and we want to make a decision whether this one is worthy of continuation or if it is not worthy of continuation, there's no need to keep it and keep spending money on it, on preserving it. Right. And so we've got to come to a point where we clean up the system and start from, not necessarily a clean street, but a more reasonable slate to start from. Wow. That, for me, is crucial. But more importantly, one of the first things I want to do when I come into, into power is to ensure that you know, discipline starts to roll out. And so I'm going to monetize in discipline a lot. Now, 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 tell me how you're going to, what that means. Monetize, monetize in discipline is... Indiscipline. Indiscipline is likely to say... Sanctions that uh, cash means... Take the indiscipline we have on our roads okay. and make money out of it. How? <laughs> How? I want the policeman on the street to have... Uh, the policeman? Yes. You want to rely on the No, policeman. hold on. Okay. And that, that goes back to something else. So okay. I, I did talk about cleaning up okay. the, the public sector, which means personnel and all that have yeah. to be uh, realigned okay. and all that. But, but go on. You want to take the policeman on the street? But I want to take the policeman on the street. Right. Um, I want to give him... Um, an equipment that allows him to check cars on the street. It could be fixed on their cars, it could be a handheld or whatever. But it starts from ensuring that when you register your car, for example, when you buy insurance, when you buy a task uh, disk, for example, all of that are linked into a central database. Mm. So all that the policeman has to do, whether he's driving in his car or standing, is to uh, take an image or 
point the instrument at your car registration number. And you should be able to tell him whether your insurance has expired, whether your tax this has expired, mm -hmm. or whether anything mm -hmm. you're driving with is, is not the right to be on the road. So that? So that once that is found out, a charge is levied. Mm -hmm. The charge is such that your car is impounded if you cannot pay on the spot. But it also brings about the insurance that we get people to be paying via their mobile money or, or automatic. So they pay on system. the spot? They pay on the spot. So if you, you don't pay on the spot, yeah. your car is towed away. So can you tell me why you think that doesn't happen now? Why do you think that doesn't happen now? But I mean, this is not magical. It doesn't happen because we don't have systems that are linked. If a policeman stops your car... That's not so complex, Kofi. Well, why, why, why? If a policeman stops your car... He has to physically look at your insurance. He cannot even tell whether it's the what, authentic insurance or not. But they know what you describe. What you've just they, described, they know. They know what they, I describe, but the fact is that they don't have what it takes to ensure that it is enforced. So somebody like that, you, you, he has a choice. He's been given room to have discretion. So what is it that you have that will make it enforceable? That's the point I'm trying to... I'm trying to get to why... You can do what others cannot do. That is what I've tried to explain to you. Yeah. We've taken out of his hand the choice to determine whether or not he takes physical cash from that driver or not. Right. We can do that now. I don't know why we're not we doing do it. it. I cannot answer for the current government. I can answer for what I want to do. Yeah. Because that man who is standing by the road knows that for every car he's able to impound... Mm. It's accruing to a benefit to the police, which accrues to a benefit to him being paid well. That's part of why he would behave, That's incentive. He would behave better. Would you train the police different? Would we can even it? decide if you don't want the police. Let's, let's give it to private enterprise because then they have a profit motive. And this would be what? This would be a way of what? Raising money or fighting? It's not system? necessarily raising money, so but it's killing two birds with one stone. Right. One, we are raising money because... Uh, we're getting money from people being indisciplined. But two, we're enforcing in, uh, discipline because we're ensuring that people now have a motive or an incentive to be disciplined. Mm. What do you do about our economy? I mean, we have been exporting primary products all our life. Mm -hmm. Even when we discover hydrocarbon resources now, mm -hmm. we do the same thing. Right. We don't add any value. It just right. goes. Mining. Mm -hmm. Cocoa. Right. These are big. What would you do? The, it's interesting you raise those points. I'll tell you something about those, all those uh, sectors you've, you've listed. Something very common about them. One is that with hydrocarbons, for example, they employ very minimal mm -hmm. levels of the population. So it doesn't really create the level of uh, employment you, you expect. The other commonality between all those three elements you've mentioned is that they are all underground. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of capital resourcing. It takes a lot of manpower mm -hmm. to get them out of the ground. We actually have economies we can create from scratch in no time. One of them is tourism, which we haven't explored well. We have tremendous culture. So you would diversify the economy? I want to add to the economy. So I don't want to So tell me what you'd add. You would add tourism. I want to expand tourism. What else? Um, I want to expand technology. And, and those two areas are key for me. What do you mean expand technology? By expand way? technology because it's, we're in a knowledge era right now. Right. Africa is the least behind in that race. We've got young people who are plugged into technology. And that's a job creator. That's a job creator. Mm. But they have just been left at that level. Right. The few who have ventured into technology, I mean the young folks who have ventured into technology and are trying to break the glass ceiling, are not being supported. Okay, let's go on. One, technology, you were saying. Right. So, so I've mentioned tourism. Yeah. I've mentioned uh, Techno exp technology, technology expanding. Um, but then there's also the element of agriculture. We focus on growing. My team wants to expand that. We want mm. to expand that into food processing, for example. Right. I don't see why we can't have chocolatiers in Ghana. And that something of chocolatiering links directly to tourism. Because then we can tie tourism in Ghana to the fact that we grow the best cocoa 
and we make some of the best chocolates from that cocoa. Do you consider agriculture our competitive advantage as a nation? It has always been our competitive advantage. And, now, and so you would, you would develop uh, We've that. just not expanded it enough. I want to see, like I said, food processing in that, in that, in that cycle. But I also want to see something interesting, even though I've mentioned it a, a bit earlier. I want to see agrotechnology. I cannot for the life of me understand why up until now, 60 years down the line, our cocoa producers, our farmers, still have to carry sacks into their shed, pour the sacks out, use the stick uh, to, yeah. to, to plush out the, uh, the beans, dry it up, pack it back into the sack, carry it back, and the following day they repeat the same thing. Are we saying we don't have graduates from our technology institutions who can actually mechanize some of those systems? Mm -hmm. So I want to see things around agrotechnology, and it's not only the mechanization process. There are young people in this country who have developed technologies to make agriculture a lot more efficient. I know people in this country who have developed technologies that can ensure that um, there is a right mix between the kind of fertilizers to even use depending on the soil there factors. There is no you scale. There is no scale. There is never any scale, and, all the and time. And that is why I want to pick out these um, so, outliers and support that. So because you would, upsc you would upscale these I things. want to upscale for good reason, uh, David. One is that it automatically feeds back into making sure our own agri chain becomes more what, efficient, but it also creates an opportunity that we can sell these technologies outside of Ghana because there are other countries in Africa that are largely agri-based. And so if it works for us here, there's every reason why it can work in, 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 uh, in Mali, it can work in Burkina Faso, it can work in Cote d'Ivoire. What kind of uh, feedback do you get when you go around talking about this? <laughs> I, mean, I want to know, are people excited? Are people, do people think this man is just another of those dreamers? How, what do you feel you get when you talk a about A dreamer, this? certainly not. Yeah, not a dreamer. Um, but man must dream, you know. I, 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 I believe in dreaming. Yeah. Um, and I believe every Ghanaian should dream. And that's, that, I think that's what every Ghanaian should have. Just a dream and a willingness to work hard at that. Dream. How's your campaign? You haven't started yet. Like you're not registered. I mean, where are you in this whole business about... Well, because I'm an individual, ballot. I'm a candidate. I'm a, 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 independent, a, a candidate. independent candidate. I don't need to. Uh, you sure? Have you we, been we have to, to wait electoral? for... Well, I have visited Electoral Commission. Uh, what does need to happen is that... Um, I need to wait and get my nomination uh, done. Um, but that's sometime next year. Right. Um, and once that nomination is done, which means getting uh, more than two signatures from all the uh, districts. Um, uh, from the 280 or so districts yeah. in Ghana, yeah. you require two signatures each. Yeah. Before At you minimum of two. Minimum of two. Yeah. You will get that. Very easily. Kofi Gani, thank you very much. Thank you for having me, David. Appreciate it.